Good afternoon. Welcome to this live recording of Help Me Teach the Bible. Uh, usually I'm sitting in a little room by myself, and I love getting to sit in this big room here at the Gospel Coalition National Conference to record this episode. I'm Nancy Guthrie. Help Me Teach the Bible is a production of the Gospel Coalition sponsored by Crossway, a not-for-profit publisher of the ESV Bible, Christian Books and Tracts. Learn more at crossway.org. I get to sit here today with my guest, David Platt. David, thank you for being willing to help us teach the Bible. To the extent with which I have anything to offer to help, I'm glad to. I kind of think you will. What do you think? David serves as pastor teacher at McLean Bible Church in Washington, D.C. He's the founder and president of Radical. And when we hear that term, Radical, we think to ourselves, yes, that's where I've heard of him. In fact, this breakout session is sponsored by Radical, which is the global ministry of David Platt. And TGC is very grateful for their generous support to help make this session possible. And you can learn more about Radical's ministry by visiting their booth. It's number 16 in the exhibit hall, or you can go online to Radical.net. And Radical is also being very generous to all of those who are actually attending this live recording in that on your way out, Radical is going to give you a free copy of the Secret Church 14 study guide. So if you're listening to this online or you're watching the live stream, you should have been here. You, you would have gotten it had you been here. Um, David has written many books besides that foundational book, Radical. He's written books like Radical Together, Follow Me, Counterculture. He's written a number of books in the Christ-Centered Exposition Commentary series. But David, you have a brand new book coming. I understand. Is it out already or is it still no, it's coming? Lord willing, in September. All right. It's called Something Needs to Change, A Call to Make Your Life Count in a World of Urgent Need. Can you give us the short version? Uh, it's, uh, it's basically, it's unlike any, any other books I've written. It's, it's an eight-day trek through the Himalayas uh, where you just come face-to-face -face with a collision of urgent spiritual and physical need. And I just uh, kind of open up my journal entries and my own wrestling with uh, truths I teach. Um, it's just a, it's one thing to ask questions or talk about the goodness of God in the middle of suffering when you're behind a, a pulpit on a Sunday morning. It's a whole other thing when you're standing the cross from uh, uh, somebody who's dying of starvation or um, a little girl who's been trafficked for, uh, yeah, to be abused. And so, uh, so just wrestling with those questions and then wrestling with the ramifications for what this means for our lives if we really believe these truths. So, Well, as you may know, this podcast is specifically to help equip people who want to get better at teaching the Bible. And so I wonder if you might be willing for us to start by telling us a little bit about your own development uh, to becoming someone who stands up front at your church at conferences like this uh, to teach the Bible. How did that come about? And are there certain people who were a model to you, a help to you? Just tell us how that developed in your life. So the first thing that comes to my mind was my first sermon. I, I had a, a youth minister who really had an indelible impact on my life. And he asked me, to, we had like a youth service once a month. And he asked me to preach when I was in eighth grade for the youth service. And uh, he Is there said, a recording of this? Uh, no, I sure hope not. Um, <laughs> So uh, I remember uh, the text I chose. I mean, I could preach from any text. I chose Revelation 3, uh, 14 through 21, church at Laodicea. And uh, I don't know. Why. So anyway, I did so much study. I had a Matthew Henry commentary, and I like, yeah, I, I studied that as much as I could. I had pages everywhere. And so, I mean, you know, the text, uh, lukewarm, spew out of my mouth, so I, uh, I walk up in front of that group, it was about 100 people, and I had a water bottle. Before I said anything, I took a sip, and I spit it out on the front row. <laughs> and I, oh. I said, that's what God thinks of you if you're oh. lukewarm. <laughs> and so I just kind of dove in from well, there. Well, that was dramatic. <laughs> 
So that was that was the first sermon. So anyway, tell me you uh, developed from yeah, there. I hope so. I hope so. Uh, so I I would say from there I, I definitely had a zeal. I, I loved studying the word, teaching it, and so started a Bible study in my house, and uh, and so that that just grew. That grew through high school, grew through college, um, but then where things really took a uh, uh, yeah, a big, big turn in my turn. own <laughs> in my own heart uh, was when I went to a seminary and I sat in a, a first day. I remember where I was sitting in an expository preaching class, and I my jaw was just on the ground thinking, Have I ever really preached God's word the way it's supposed to be preached? Like I know my heart was good, but like really studying as I ought to, what it means to expose the voice of God. And uh, Jim Shaddix uh, was teaching that class. He became a mentor to me uh, in preaching. And just his zeal for, love for, and reverence for the authority of God's word just totally changed my look on, on preaching uh, from that point. So anyway, I, yeah, it's a pretty awesome privilege that we have to Isn't communicate it? this word. Uh, and it. so I, uh, I'm not over that. Yeah. I'm not over that. You are often, I notice, and anybody who has uh, seen or heard you preach, you are often very emotional, often always very passionate. In fact, I was talking to someone this morning about interviewing you today, and he put it this way, that there is a visceral element of God's concern for the lost Mm -hmm. in you that he hears when you preach. So will you talk to us a, a little bit about using emotion and demonstrating passion in our teaching. I I think some people fear being too emotional, um, and other people actually express very little emotion or passion, and sometimes that's just out of desire to put really the, the focus on the text. So what would you say about those elements in terms of emotion and passion for those of us who are trying to become more effective Bible teachers? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I, I know we all have different personalities. I think non-negotiable, though, for anybody who's proclaiming the word uh, is that it needs to be, the text needs to be internalized in us. And so it, it needs to have a hold of our hearts. Uh, and obviously that's going to look different and different, but it needs to have a hold in heart. So I, I mentioned Jim Shaddix. I remember uh, one day he and I were going to like tag team preach. And so we were tag team preparing and just doing preparation together. And I remember we, he said, all right, let's start. But it, if we didn't start with a bunch of resources, he said, let's get on our knees. And so we just open up the text. We have read through it and we just start praying through the text mm. on our knees. I look over, he's like, weeping over the text, like really just, I mean, emotionally affected by it. And that really stuck with me. Like I, I, I thought I, I want that to be, uh, yeah, a part of my life and preaching ministry that it's really affecting my heart. So, so then, because the last thing we want to do is like trying to manufacture kind of emotion totally. in any preaching or teaching of God's word. Like that's not pleasing to God. It's not helpful to anybody. An audience Um, feels manipulated by that. Yeah, so I think that's really unhealthy. But if the text has affected you, I think it's going to come out. And I would would just say, um, to the extent of which possible, the mood of the text should be reflected in the mood of the proclamation of that text. So if it's a really serious passage about judgment, it would make no sense to preach that passage with like a big smile on your face uh, the whole time. It's just like, okay, something's not adding up here. Or if it's a text about joy and you're like totally dry, it's like, okay, that's not. So we want to reflect the text as much as possible. And, and I just think the text is glorious. And so that should come out in our preaching. Uh, I think this is one thing I've learned from watching John Piper preach. I think he, he reflects the mood of the text. I mean, we're just, he's, yesterday just interacting with the text and it's affecting the way he he's serious at this point he's like happy at this point because the text is leading to that so i think again it'll play out differently in different personalities but we should be affected by that which we are teaching and i think that's going to come out well we're here today to talk about teaching that ignites a passion for the world And that's because that's something that you have done very effectively 
three in your church in Birmingham, and now you're in D.C., and it seems to me that if we're going to teach that, that that's maybe not just like we take one week in the year and we're going to focus on igniting a passion for the world, but that instead this might be something that because it's the heartbeat of God himself, it would arise and come through our teaching almost anywhere we are Mm -hmm. in the Bible. We don't want to artificially do that, but we do want to let it arise when it's there. So I'm wondering if we could spend our next time, if we could just walk through various parts of the Bible, and if you might be willing to demonstrate from these various parts of the Bible and the Bible story and different genre, how you would might suggest that we go about igniting a passion mm. for the world from out of those passages. And we're going to have to move quickly, so there's no time for passionate preaching from you here. Mm. Uh, but why don't we begin in Genesis? I mean, that's where all, right. all good things begin, isn't it? Yes. In Genesis, we've got just this garden, especially in one and two, and then three, everything changes. So when you're looking right here at the beginning, do you see a passion for the world right in these beginning chapters of the Bible? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, and and I, I'm, I'm loving this exercise. Okay. I'll try not to preach a bunch. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> that's okay. Um, you can break out a little, but I might just reel you back in. That's great. You. That's okay. great. And I, I'll just add this because this was another jaw on the ground moment for me. I remember where I was sitting in a breakout session at a conference in college and uh, Jeff Lewis, um, who teaches now at Cal Baptist University and is actually coming on and helping with the radical stuff right now. But anyway, Jeff um, opened the Bible in that breakout session. He walked from Genesis to Revelation, and he showed God's zeal for his glory among the nations from cover to cover. And it, I just will never forget, it, it was like, whoa, this changes everything. Mm-hmm. It was eye-opening for me. So I'm loving this Okay, exercise. good deal. All um, right. So yes, Genesis. Uh, and So I would say... Uh, God's passion for his glory in all nations is going to be in all these texts, and we don't need to try to impose it, um, uh, but it's all, it's laced throughout the entire mm-hmm. Bible. So Genesis 1, obviously, his glorious creator, he creates us in his image with the capacity to know him, and then the first command he gives is Genesis 1, God bless them, said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth with my image. And mm. so from the very beginning, you have this commission to multiply for the spread of God's blessing and glory in the world in a way that is then uh, uh, totally neglected, actually disobeyed in Genesis 11, for come, let us uh, build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the earth. So it's a total disobedience to God's command to multiply, and it's all about man, not the glory of God which then leads in Genesis chapter 12 to that blessing of Abraham. And he says, no, this is my design. I'm going to bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And uh, him who dishonors you, I will curse. And through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So clearly we see a picture of God's desire for uh, his blessing to be made known. So Genesis 1, 11, 12, his blessing to be known among his people for the spread of his blessing to all peoples. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's, so and we're 12 a... chapters in and it's clear. So there's a sense right there at the beginning in Genesis that God's desire is that the whole earth be filled with with his his offspring, bearing his image, declaring his glory. And we might think at the fall that that has, that there's going to have to be a shift, that this is not going to happen. Hmm. And so then when we get to Abraham, we discover, no, he hasn't forgotten that plan. That's right. But it's going to go about a different way. Mm -hmm. It's the same plan. From the beginning, God is zealous about his glory being made known and his image bearers filling the earth with his glory. So when we do get there in Genesis chapter 12, and uh, Abraham is told you're going to be a blessing, and in fact, through you, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. Let's say you were teaching that passage. Can you give us a taste of what you would say that would help to ignite that passion in those we're teaching? I would just say, I mean, feel the wonder and the weight of what God is saying here to this pagan idolater named Abram. Uh, 
I'm going to bless you. I'm going to pour out my blessing on you. This is the pure, undeserved favor of God. None of us deserve such grace. Abram didn't deserve it. None of us deserve it. This is the blessing of God. Yet, it doesn't center on Abram. It's not just for him. It is for so that through you and your offspring, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God doesn't intend his blessing to center on us. He intends his blessing to spread through us um, in a way that resounds to his glory as it spreads through us. Mm. So that's clear. And, it's, and you see the same thing, Genesis 26.4, Genesis 28.14, the same promises to Isaac and Jacob flow. I'm going to multiply your offspring like the stars of heaven, and through your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. They'll spread out to the west and the east, north and south. All peoples on earth shall be blessed through you and your offspring. Mm-hmm. Like it's clear. It's unmistakable. God is not just blessing a people. They are intended to be the conduit of his blessing to all mm-hmm. the peoples. Well, that plan seems threatened when we turn the page to the book of Genesis. Because now these are a people and they are two million strong, mm-hmm. but they are enslaved in Egypt. And in fact, the Pharaoh is working on his plan to actually mm-hmm. wipe out this nation by killing all of the baby boys. Mm-hmm. Um, but they emerge from there and God speaks to them and he tells them what he intends for them to be and what mm-hmm. he plans for them to do. So key texts along these lines, yes. In there, uh, well, you just look at his words, uh, God's words to Pharaoh in Exodus 9, 16. For this reason, I've raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. God's zealous for his glory in the salvation of his people. Exodus uh, Exodus 14, obviously after the Passover. I, I, I think it's helpful as we read through these texts and think about these different uh, stages in redemptive history, just to ask the question, why? Why is God yes. doing what he's doing? So you get to ex- Exodus 14, when God has led his people out of Egypt, they come to the uh, Red Sea. So why would God, I, I don't, I'm not a military expert, but it doesn't <laughs> seem wise to lead your people to a dead end where an, over, uh, an army is about to overtake you behind you. Why would you do that? And Exodus 14, 4 tells us why. I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Basically, God says, I'm going to split the sea in half, send you through on dry land, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord, which is a phrase we see, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly how many times, but over and over and over, they will know that I'm the Lord. They will know that I'm the Lord. And even God saying, I'm going to deliver you out from slavery for what purpose? So that you may worship me. That's why the whole second half of the book of Exodus is about worship according to God's word, tabernacle, uh, uh, the, uh, the law and the tabernacle. It's all about worship. It all ends with his glory. And picture it, Exodus 40 ends with uh, uh, God's glory dwelling among his people, but not just stationary. They're following his glory as this pillar of cloud leads them. And it's a picture Moses will point back to in his intercession at different points, like the nations see your glory leading this people. So you can't spare them. This is when, or you can't uh, destroy them. Exodus 32, actually where I was reading uh, today in Numbers, when uh, Numbers 14, uh, just in my time of the Lord, when, uh, sorry, I'm skipping ahead of Numbers. No, that's okay. Uh, you can go on to numbers. So, well, when, when he says he's praying, he says you can't destroy this people uh, because the nations are watching. You lead them, and you have brought them out not to destroy them, but to save them, to keep your promises to them, to bring them into this land. Like he is appealing to the purpose of God among the nations. You have mm. saved them for your praise, mm. uh, so you can't destroy them. Isn't there something here when he says, tells them who they're going to be and what they're going to do? You're going to be a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. Mm -hmm. Yes. And in this, a demonstration of his grace and his glory uh, as his unique people on display for the peoples to see. Well, as we move on from the Pentateuch, um, we get into Joshua. And I think this is where it may get a little bit more difficult Mm. for us as Bible teachers to uh, be working on suggesting uh, God's heart for the nations because when we get to the establishment of Israel as a nation, um, the people are being commanded to move into Canaan and actually destroy, and it's very harsh language, you know, defeat, destroy, 
demolished the Canaanites in the land. And so we know that for many people, it's, they look at that part of the Old Testament and they can't even make sense of that kind of God, and mm. they do all things to a lot of things to diminish that. Mm. So we don't want to diminish that. Mm. Um, yet it is a challenge for us in regard, maybe when we're teaching. Um, so how do we help people understand what is happening there and how that fits into God's plan to bless all the mm. peoples of the earth? I think uh, without question, like some of those. Texts in Joshua and Judges are really, really hard texts to preach. I think mainly because we have a pretty man-centered perspective of sin, and we. So I, I think that the, we've got to step back. And even you think about Revelation. I was having a conversation with my son. I know we're not jumping to Revelation yet, but uh, <laughs> about all the imagery there. That's just. Uh, I mean, it's some pretty frightening imagery. And it's reality uh, in, well, it's reality in Revelation, but it's, it's played out in, in pictures. So I think we, we're reminded in the books of Joshua, Judges, that God is, he's not just the savior of the nations, he's also the judge of the nations. And sin before a holy God it deserves holy, right, just wrath. And we see this played out in uh, different. And as we know, as we walk through the scriptures, there will be places where that judgment will be poured out even on the people of Israel in their disobedience. And God's obviously made that clear. I mean, even just some of the ways in uh, Deuteronomy that he said, if you disobey me, these things will happen to you. And it's, it's really frightening language there. But this is where uh, God is, he is the judge of the nations. Again, I I think, so we, we, we obviously, we preach those texts for what they are, and we, we talk about the seriousness of sin before a holy God, and uh, um, at the same time, I think even this compels us to a missional passion, because we know, we know judgment is coming upon the nations. Mm -hmm. We know judgment is coming upon those who disobey God, mm -hmm. who do not trust in the salvation of God, and so... Uh, Preaching these texts should drive us to be all the more zealous to make the good news of God's grace known because uh, the nations are under his judgment. And I think the text does demonstrate God's grace mm. for us. If we think about the book of Joshua, perhaps that's why we have that story there of Rahab. Mm -hmm. She's this one who is outside right. of Israel, and yet she's heard about their God and how he's given them victory. And she takes hold of them. And by that, really, she's taking hold of their God. She yes. wants to be one of those people who experiences that blessing. And it's a, mm -hmm. it's a beautiful picture, I think, of grace yes. for those who will turn toward God and take hold of him by faith. Absolutely. And then and I, there's powerful pictures like mm -hmm. Rahab, Ruth, mm -hmm. a Moabite, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a people under curse for sin, right. and yet God redeems, uh, and we see this powerful picture, and obviously Rahab and Ruth, both that will appear in the line that leads to Jesus. It's right. pretty powerful. And it's good news for us. I think about Paul when he says, for you were once foreigners, yeah. strangers, yeah. aliens to the promises of God, and now you have been brought near. Hmm. Beautiful picture of that. All right, so we move, they, they move into the land. And we go through the period of the judges, and then God is good to give his people the kind of king he wants, mm. a king after mm. his own heart, mm. kind of king he wants for his people. And we see this picture uh, in First and Second Samuel, First Kings, of David establishing a kingdom. It tells us in uh, chapter 8 of First Samuel, he, he's, he's ruling, in, or in Second Samuel, he's ruling in justice and mm. righteousness. Mm. And then we get the picture of Solomon, uh, his son, and you see all these nations of the world and even this queen of Sheba, and she's coming and she wants to find out what's going on there. Mm -hmm. So those might be a couple of things yes. we could do from that. What else, how else could we use that period of these historical books to show God's heart for the nations? Again, I, I, I mean, mentioning even that last one, so 1 Kings 10, when I think about 
again, asking that question, why? Like, why was Solomon so wise? Uh, well, this pagan queen comes, sees his wisdom, sees the blessing of God in his life, and here's a pagan queen giving glory to God for his grace in Solomon's life. And this is what God is doing. God is, he's uh, blessing his people for the sake of his praise among all the peoples. And so in the establishment of the Davidic kingdom, the even the picture of his promises to David and then the fulfillment of those promises, even in the building of the temple, construction of the temple. I mean, this is a picture of the glory of God dwelling among his people. But we know like, there's a court of Gentiles in that temple. And uh, so God desires, and we'll see this all throughout scripture, the nations to come and worship him. That it's not, it's never just about this people. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's unquestionably a covenant relationship between God and the people of Israel and a special relationship in that. But they are always, ever since the beginning, they're still intended to be a conduit of God's blessing to the nations. And so we see that in the establishment of the kingdom and the promises that flow from that. Then we move into this time of the divided kingdom. Mm -hmm. And when we read the prophets, uh, like the prophet Isaiah and some of the others. And they, a lot of them have a lot to say about other nations mm. and countries. And it can be a little bit confusing, I think, because we'll read in one place about all this judgment that's going to come down on all of these nations, and then other places where there's hope that some of these nations mm. will actually come in and take part of the kingdom. So mm. I wonder if there might be a particular place in the prophets or something more general from the prophets that you would help us make sense of those things if, we're, if yeah. we're someone who gets confused when we read both of those things. Sure. You know, are we going to go to the Psalms at all? I we just are. Forgot. We're okay. going to come okay. back okay. to that. All right. yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, I was just thinking, oh, no. I Kingdom, skipped to the Psalms. David, Psalms. I, I, like, I'm not so going to skip the Psalms. Okay, all right, it's great. Um, so the prophets. Uh, yes, I, I think picture, blessing, and judgment. These are themes that we see all throughout, not well, on both the people of Israel and the nations. And so we see evidences of both. Uh, I mean, you think about uh, Jonah would obviously be a perfect example of a pagan nation um, that God says, I'm going to destroy, but God sends a prophet uh, from his people to proclaim uh, repent and be saved, and God does it. And it's a reluctant prophet. Oh, there's obviously so much there. But, uh, but then even just, I, I just think about uh, Isaiah 43, Isaiah 66, Ezekiel 36. Uh, I mean, we can go into all, I'm trying not to preach different sermons. But all right, we'll just well, we'll do take a little Ezekiel one. 36, yeah. 22 and 23. When God says to his people, it's not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm gonna do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, the name you have profaned among the nations, and the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I show myself holy through you before their eyes. Like God just said to his people, and all that he's doing in disciplining them, sending them into exile, bringing them back, he said, I'm doing all of this not for your sake, but for the sake of my holy name, which you, so that's a very God-centered picture of God. I'm not doing this for your sake for the sake of my holy name, among the nations where you have gone. The nations will know that I am the Lord. Like, it couldn't be any clearer what, uh, what is on the heart of God here, his own glory among the nations, even in his saving his people, his judging his people. And so that's kind of the theme we see woven throughout the stories of the divided kingdom and the prophets who are proclaiming in there. Uh, and and looking forward to eschatological hope even. Uh, I mean, uh, I just think about Zechariah 8, 20 through 23. Like the people will grab the uh, garments of those who are coming to the temple and the nations will come and gather for worship. Even Isaiah 56, um, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, uh, which we know Jesus uh, will quote from mm -hmm. in the temple. But why would he quote from Isaiah 56? Well, because the temple... I mean, and why he was overturning tables. Uh, I mean, there's multiple reasons, multiple things that are going on there. But one of them is they had set up shop, not in the court of Jewish men or the court of Jewish women. They'd set up shop in the court of the Gentiles, the court of the nations. Basically, they had said, uh, we're going to make profit here and do our business here and to hell with the nations. And that's why he quotes from Isaiah 56, because no, God desires the nations to come and worship him. So it's just blessing and judgment 
on his people and on the nations that we see woven throughout mm -hmm. divided kingdom and prophets. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go back to Psalms now yeah. because I really do want to land there for a while. It's a, to me a beautiful thing. If we think of the Psalms as being divine words God has provided to us to sing and respond to him, it's a beautiful thing to me that he puts on our lips mm -hmm. a song to sing of joy over his intentions mm -hmm. to save a people for, for himself from many nations. Mm -hmm. So what are the some of the psalms that you just love to use to uh, demonstrate this? Yeah, well, I, yes. Uh, one of the reason why psalms, I, I was thinking about it the other day. Like the fact that we have like a whole... Uh, 150 chapters, a whole hymn book yeah. that is written for the glory of God. I was thinking, what if I went to my wife and said, babe, I wrote 150 poems about how great I am. And uh, I want to give them to you as a gift. And uh, I just want you to say them to me. <laughs> It's going to be so good for your heart. <laughs> that feels like, but this is what God is. So this, God is God-centered, and it is good for our hearts mm. to sing praises to him. But this is, he's very different from us. Mm. Um, and, uh, but, and, and so it's, it's Psalms we love, like Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me, guides me in paths of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. For his name's sake. Like it's. Everything he does, he is such a good shepherd to us, and he does it for the sake of his name. And, and it's for the sake of his name among the nations. I, I forgot the exact number of psalms that reference the nations, but it's all throughout. I mean, certainly in a Psalm 96, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all the peoples. Like the praise of God, it's, according to the psalms, clearly is not intended to be confined to his people. It is intended to be spread among all the peoples. I think about Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us, bless us, make his face to shine upon us. This is what I pray over my kids every night. Uh, may God be gracious to us, bless us, make his face to shine upon us so that his ways may be known on earth and his saving power known among all nations. Like why would God be gracious to us, bless us, make his face shine upon us so that his ways may be known on earth, his salvation known among all nations. That's why he blesses us, for the sake of his praise among the nations. Psalm 66, right before that, shout to God all the earth. Psalm 68, right after that, uh, it's like God on the move. Uh, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. And we see just this picture of the glory of God spreading in the world through his people. Uh, we could go on and on mm, with the Psalms. Beautiful, thank you. Well, why don't we make our way into the New Testament, okay. into the Gospels? I think most people would think that's actually where the story of God's mission begun, mm. began, and you've convinced us otherwise. Um, so. But there were certainly some key things here. Mm -hmm. So in the Gospels, how do we um, teach the Gospels in a way that ignites a passion mm. for the world? I think, it's, I think it's really helpful in the Gospels to show uh, in Jesus' ministry the focus on not just the Jewish people, which obviously there is a unique relationship there, but the way he goes uh, to Gentiles, the way he interacts with Gentiles, there are so many examples of that. Um, even just in the very beginning of his ministry in Matthew 4, I mean, as we're opening things up, it's interesting. He, we, we, we don't just see him focused on Jewish people from the very beginning. We see him broadening uh, to Galilee of the Gentiles. Like it's a, it's a picture that then is woven throughout and in a way that, well, I mean, we could just look at story after story, but then it's not a coincidence that at the end of Matthew, make disciples of all the nations. Like we, we need to feel the, uh, I guess, unique nature of that. This was, I mean, people may have been expecting a Jewish Messiah for the Jewish people. For him, his last words in this very, Jewish focused book of Matthew to, uh, to be make disciples of all the ethne, all the peoples. And, uh, and then of course, Mark 16, 15, preach the good news to all creation. Luke 24, 47 through 49, like Jesus died so that repentance and forgiveness of sins would be preached in all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And so it's, it's clear in Jesus' example and then it's clear in his commission in the end. And so uh, clearly Jesus is uh, 
in the flesh doing what God mm. has been about since mm. the very beginning of creation. You touched Matthew, Mark, Luke there. I'm thinking about John. I have many sheep who are no. not of this no. fold, and they must come in. Yes. I mean, that's, I think it's just really helpful. I don't want to impose anything on any text, but this book is written in the context of a, of a, of, of mission, and by that I mean a global purpose of God to save people for the sake of his praise mm-hmm. from among all the peoples. Mm-hmm. So, and, and to sort of make sure we preach it as such. Well, it seems to me we get a big basket of possibilities yes. for teaching in this way handed to us in the book of Acts. Uh, what are some of the passages that come to mind to you that you would really want to make the most of? Uh, uh, I mean, Acts 1.8, obviously uh, witnesses to the ends of the earth and just in the way that unfolds, Acts chapter 2, uh, all these nations... Uh, hearing the wonders of God in their own tongues. Um, and then, uh, so you've got a picture of the spread of the gospel then, uh, starting there in Acts chapter 2 and flowing. But then you, you get to, it's interesting, right? Uh, Jesus had said, there'll be witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. When you get to chapter 7, the gospel's still stuck in Jerusalem. Um, and uh, so it's martyrdom of Stephen that actually leads to the gospel spreading uh, to Judea and Samaria. So Stephen's martyred, Acts chapter 8, verse 3 or 4. Uh, now uh, those who were persecuted uh, with the stoning of Stephen scattered, preaching the gospel everywhere they went. Then you see Philip and uh, Ethiopian eunuch uh, actually reading from Isaiah 56, not coincidentally, uh, in Acts chapter 8. So this Ethiopian eunuch just so happens to be reading a passage about how God it's blessing is for all the nations. And so then, of course, you get to nine, uh, Paul's conversion for the spread of the gospel to the Gentiles. I've saved you for the spread of the gospel to the Gentiles. You get to chapter 10, Peter Cornelius. Uh, the Gentiles. Big, big turning moment in the early church where they realize this gospel isn't just for us. It is for all the peoples. Then you get to chapter 11, those who were scattered because of the persecution with Stephen are preaching the gospel in Antioch. Uh, And some of them preached to Greeks also. A great number of them believed in the Lord. You have the founding of the church at Antioch, which then becomes, in Acts chapter 13, the base of missionary sending. So you have the first missionary journey going out from there in Paul and Barnabas in Acts chapter 13. We're now spreading the gospel in places where it's not gone. Uh, First missionary journey back to uh, Antioch, Jerusalem conference, thinking, what do we do with all these Gentiles that are coming in? What kind of rules is uh, uh, laws do we hold them to? And they're sent out on their second missionary journey, Acts 16. Uh, then third missionary journey, obviously at that point, Paul knows he's not going back to Antioch because he wants to get to Rome, so he writes a letter to Romans. Uh, so the whole, and, and the whole reason he wrote the letter to the Romans, You guys right? can do uh, that with Acts 2, so, right? Uh, yeah. Well, it's just glorious, right? Like it's, it's on every page. And, uh, and, and over and over again, the word of the Lord spread. The uh, word of God spread. They the glorified word the spread. word of the Lord. The, the Gentiles were appointed to, who were appointed to eternal life believed. The Gentiles glorified the word of the Lord. Uh, that's Acts 13, 48. And yeah, and that whole book follows that pattern that Jesus had left him with to the Jew first mm-hmm. and to Judea and to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I mean, that's almost, that's the shape of the book of Acts, mm-hmm. isn't it? Yes. Yes, and it's the way, it's the way the, the and, and then you get to the end, and the kingdom of God is being proclaimed without hindrance. Uh, yeah. As, uh, yeah, as Paul is uh, now, yeah, on his way to Rome, and, and, and the whole reason, right, he wanted to go to Rome, right, was, well, we're about to get into yeah. epistles. Yes, yeah, so let's get to the epistles. Okay. All right. Um, a lot of the epistles are speaking to churches in various places uh, that are being planted, around the world. So are there certain places in the epistles that you really lean toward for this? Yeah, I think the, one of the keys with the epistles is to remember that context. This is a church planting context. Like this is the gospels going forward into new places. Churches are being planted in new places. And, uh, and that's the letters that are written or to encourage churches in, that have just been planted, that are in, uh, new territory. I mean, it's all in the context of mission, I guess, is the main thing to remember. And then, of course, so Romans, I would maintain that, that part of the purpose of the book of Romans was to persuade and encourage the church at Rome to help Paul get the gospel to uh, Spain because the gospel had not yet gone there. It's like a missionary support letter. Uh, 
Uh, when you look at Romans chapter 15, he goes through my ambition is to preach the gospel where, where Christ has not been named. That is why I'm writing this to you so that you can support me on my journey there. So it's not just Romans 1 through 8 isn't just like glorious picture of the gospel just so we have it. Like it's glorious picture of the gospel, yes, to encourage us, but also to motivate us. People in Spain have never even heard this, Paul says. They've got to hear it. He's writing this from Corinth. He knows Antioch is not the best place to help him get to Spain, so he writes this letter to Rome to say, help me get the gospel to Rome. And so, uh, and then you've got the fledgling, yeah, whether it's the church at Corinth and other churches struggling with this or that, that he's obviously working for the purity of the gospel in and the way that plays out in the church. But even when, when you see Paul, like in Galatians, uh, when he says in, in 1, 15 and 16, for God was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. Like, Paul, why was God pleased to reveal Jesus to you? So that I might preach him among the nations. Like it, his salvation was equated with mission in, in those verses. Uh, and then you look at, at even just the gospel message itself is a message for uh, not just one type of people. You get to Galatians three fourteen. This is a key verse when... Jesus, uh, Paul's talking about Jesus became a curse for us and not just for this people, but so that all peoples will be blessed. It's the same language we've seen from the very beginning and all that the Paul's doing there, kind of talking about old covenant. And so it's, it's for the purpose. Uh, and then you get to Ephesians 2 uh, mm. and it's the Jews and Gentiles coming together in the church. So this is a new man. One it's man. a new body that's, that's not just one type of people. Like we, yeah, so... I don't know if we should keep going mm. to all the letters. But uh, <laughs> anyway, it's, it's all. So the, through you, Thessalonian church, the church is, res- the gospel is resounding around the world. Uh, so just among all these different peoples, it's creating all kinds of problems uh, and challenges as the gospel goes to Gentiles, not just Jews. But, uh, and those, those are challenges that are real in anybody who works in cross-cultural settings around the world. But mm. this is the beauty. When you look at the church, uh, I just... I mean, not even just around the world. I think about the church that I have the privilege of pastoring. Like, there's over 100 nations represented in this church. Like, there's only one explanation for why all these people from all these different nations are together in this room on a Sunday, and it's because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like, if it's found that he is, uh, he, he's not alive, he's not been risen from the then our community makes no sense. Mm-hmm. So, and that's what we're seeing on the pages of the epistles in the mm-hmm. New Testament. Beautiful. All right. Now the best part of the story, Uh, and it's all headed toward here, right? The consummation, which is uh, so beautifully pictured in the book of Revelation as John is given a vision. Um, Tell us about some of the beautiful things that we can anticipate in terms of how God is going to bring this whole story of his plan for the nations together Mm. that we discover in Revelation. Uh, I mean, the obvious texts are Revelation 4 and 5, the visions there, and Revelation 7. I mean, worthy are you, O Lord, that you have purchased people for God from every nation, tribe, tongue, language. Like, Jesus has purchased people from all the ethne. And uh, and so he said in the beginning, all peoples are going to be blessed through you and your offspring. In the end, all peoples are blessed, like Revelation 7, 9 and 10, a multitude no one can count from every nation, tribe, tongue, and people gather around the throne of God singing praises. Salvation belongs to our God and the Lamb who sits on the throne. Like, all of history is headed toward that day. <laughs> and so, uh, oh, if that's where history's headed, if that's where the train of history is headed, then I want to call people to get on that train. <laughs> like, live for that day. Like, let your heart beat. Like, this is not an isolated theme in the Bible. This is the purpose of God in the world. Therefore, the purpose of God in our life. And then all the way to, uh, um, I mean, even in Revelation chapter 22, when we see those bookends, um, and so the garden picture from the mm-hmm. very beginning, and, and uh, no longer is there any curse. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you have the tree mm-hmm. uh, that reappears in yep. Revelation chapter 22, but now no longer any curse because its tree, its leaves are for the healing of the nations. Boom. Drop the mic. <laughs> Revelation 22. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Like, bring yes. it about uh, the day where uh, the nations, all the nations, find their healing in uh, Christ. Oh. So, that's where it's all going. We look forward to going. that day, don't we? Look forward to that day. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. 
Well, what you've done is just take this theme of the nations or God's uh, mission for the world. You've traced it from Genesis to Revelation. And I hope you won't mind if I just insert a little plug here for some workshops that I'm going to be doing around the country um, beginning next September through May of 2020. Um, I can't tell you a lot yet, but on May 1st, I will announce them. I'm going to be doing some biblical theology workshops for women in 15 cities. And my aim is going to be to train women to trace themes from Genesis to Revelation, kind of like David just did. So if, you, if that interests you and you want to know what cities those are, check my website, nancyguthrie.com, after May 1st, and you'll have all that information there. But David... Um, when we are teaching and we know and we have as this aim, we, we want people's hearts to catch on fire uh, with a, a passion for the nations. Anytime we teach, no matter what we're teaching, we have to anticipate objections from our audience and in our teaching address them. And I wonder if you could talk to us about some of the personal objections, perhaps ideological objections, practical objections, even theological objections that we might expect from people we are teaching uh, when we're calling them to have a passion for world mission. Hmm. I, think, uh, I think the biggest one is just a, uh, a mentality that as soon as they hear, as soon as many people hear the word mission or nations, they just kind of Check out. Check out. And that's exactly. like, oh, that's for those people in the church. Mm -hmm. Like this compartmentalized program in the church for a select few people who are like called to that, kind of different. Uh, and so like it's, and it's, it's really sad that we've taken like the global purpose of God in history and turned it into a compartmentalized program in the church uh, for a select few people who are called to that. Like, so that's where I, I, I've constantly got in my mind uh, just trying to undercut that, trying to um, just show, like, this is not, this is not just for a few people. This is for all of us. Like, we have breath for the spread of God's glory in the world. I think about just a couple Sundays ago, uh, I was preaching on, uh, yeah, we've been walking through Exodus, uh, and so we were talking about the uh, spread of God's worship, that being part of the point in Exodus. He had delivered, not part of the point, the point. He delivered them for the sake of his worship for the spread of his glory. And I, so I, as soon as I said that, like God's people are saved for the spread of his glory in the world and uh, for the spread of his glory among the nations. I think I said, and then I said, now I know, like I see thought bubbles around the room <laughs> right now. Like you're thinking, well, not everybody's called to go to the nations. Mm. And so I said, uh, so I want to speak to those thought bubbles <laughs> and, uh, and just said, yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying everybody's supposed to, so the, the takeaway is not everybody's supposed to pack up and move to a, another country for the spread of the gospel, but you were created, like every one of you, you were created and you have been saved by God for the spread of his glory in the world. And your life is his to be spent toward that end. Like it's a blank check before him. How do you wanna use me uh, for your glory in the world? Like this is for every, so that's what I'm after. I'm after like, uh, if the spirit of Christ is in you, the spirit of Christ wants the world for Christ. So every single follower of Christ wants the world for Christ. Like your, our heart should beat for the spread of God's glory among the nations because that's what God's heart beats for. Like if I could use that terminology, but for his glory in the nations. That's, what, that's the why, the big why in scripture. It's the big why of our lives. So that's where I'm just constantly looking for opportunities to uh, just... I just want the framework in which people see their lives to see it in the context of God's big picture global purpose. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then what'll happen is they'll just start to see it in uh, woven through the Bible at all kinds of different points. And that's where I do wanna encourage pastors or just anybody who regularly teaches the Bible to, yeah, refuse to just preach a mission sermon every once in a while. Like, show this theme of God's zeal for his glory in all nations and the way our lives are a part of that. Just show that every time it comes up and it will come up all the time if you're sensitive to it. Um, and uh, I mean, this is why Jesus died, so that repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached among the nations. Like this is, I would 
argue in a sense, it's a core part of the gospel message is that it's not, it's just not salvation for a people. It is salvation for all peoples. And uh, so I think we've just got it. There, there's a lot of work to be done in speaking of those thought bubbles that come yeah. up uh, whenever you mention mission, nations, et cetera. So one thought is, okay, that's for those people in the church who are kind of missions mm -hmm. oriented. I wonder if another resistance area comes from people who have been very influenced by our culture. And I think our culture says, how arrogant are you to go to another part of the world and tell them to worship another god uh, and completely change, you know, um, the, the focus of their cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. I, I, and just added to that, it makes me think about, like, if, if there's something in the news about someone who's a missionary, I notice that the uh, general media, they are quick to talk about a missionary. If that, mission, that missionary has to be doing, like, medical work mm -hmm. or work with the poor somehow for them to receive any kind of esteem, because the world sees going in to actually proclaim the gospel as, I don't know, arrogant. Maybe there's some other mm -hmm. words for how they would perceive it. So how do, how do we help those we're teaching kind of get over that no. hump? I, that's a great question. I, and I say on, on objections like this, I say we hit them head on in our teaching. So kind of like the thought level, like, okay, so some of you are thinking, that sounds pretty arrogant. And I, I'm tracking with you, like, all right, for me to go, think about northern India, 600 million people, tiny percentage, smallest percentage of Christians, followers of Christ, most Hindu, many Muslim, so, like, whatever the percentage is, you got hundreds of millions of people who you're going over there and saying, if you don't believe what I believe, you're going to spend an eternity in hell. That, that feels really bold and arrogant unless it's true. But if it's true, if it's true, then the most arrogant thing I could do is sit back here and never think about how to get to Northern India with this message. And if it's true, arrogance is... Uh, building church budgets and living Christian lives that turn a total deaf ear to the unreached people groups in India. That is arrogant. The most humble thing, if this gospel message is true, the most humble thing we can do is give our lives proclaiming it and spend our resources in the church getting this good news to those who've never heard it. That's, that's humility. That's, uh, in many cases, sacrifice. That's, uh, um, so it, it all hinges on whether or not the gospel is true. And so I think that's where uh, to hit those, those kind of objections head on and uh, to just bring gospel light to bear because we, we have a very warped way of thinking. I mean, one of the other things, people won't say it, but we're just an, a pretty uh, ethnocentric people. Like we, we're drawn to people who look like us, who think like us. We're not drawn to go to people. And, and I mean, uh, it's, and, and so to really challenge that, uh, God has not just died to save people. Jesus has not just died to save people who look like you. Uh, and, people, and, and he's, he's actually died to save people who are your enemies. Uh, I mean, to think, I mean, we're, we're, we're calling people in, in mission through the Bible to go to really hard place, especially when we talk about unreached people, like nations where the gospel's not yet gone, where Christ has not been named, to use Romans 15 kind of language. I mean, there's a reason why it's not gone there. There's resistance to the gospel getting there. It's hard to get there. It's dangerous to get there. It's uh, like the, all the easy people groups are taken. Um, and so, so when we're calling people to go to the nations, we're calling them to go to West Africa um, in the middle of Boko Haram or... Uh, the Horn of Africa and Al Shabaab and uh, uh, ISIS in the Middle East and what, what like and so just to say I mean some of you think I, I, I was talking with somebody who uh, teaches at a Christian university recently and they said they were telling me that trustees at the school have forbid students from taking trips to 
uh, North Africa and the Middle East and uh, because it's too dangerous. And I said, so the trustees don't want to be a part of the accomplishment of the Great Commission? Uh, and they said, uh, they said, well, the problem is not really the trustees. It's more the parents mm -hmm. because the parents don't want their kids to go. And it's like, oh, so we, we don't want our kids to be a part of the accomplishment of the Great Commission. This is where we've got to go straight at these, like, like this is... Uh, this is why we're on this earth, for the spread of the gospel to the nations. We don't, we, we've been given a clear command, and so just to go right, and it's, 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 uh, it just goes totally against the way we're wired to think, not just in America, but in many of our churches in America. And we've just got to think differently. We've got to think so differently. And, uh, that, that's, and that's why, that's another reason why it's so important, I think, that we show this in the Word, uh, mm -hmm. Just over and over again at all ages, like yeah. children seeing this, students seeing this, uh, men and women seeing this, and all, and so so that it's not just this thing on the side. It's so that it makes sense for a child to grow up hearing this Sunday after Sunday. This is one of the things I excites me most about pastoring is kids who grow up in the church hearing this week after week after week. And so when it comes time to decide what to do with their lives, they're like, well, how can I make God's glory in all nations? Like I want them to, that to be their heartbeat when they're making that decision. And this is not a sign. And parents to be raising their kids along those lines. I just think it changes the fabric of the church when we are focused on the glory of God among the nations. And, and, and they'll only give their lives. Sorry, I'm, I'm kind of going off. Um, they'll only give their lives to this if God's word compels them to. Like, I don't want to, like, convince somebody to go move to the Middle East or North Africa and the difficulty just because I said it was a good idea. I only want them to go because they've seen it. They've got conviction that my life is worth spreading the glory of God among the nations, that this is where all history is headed, and that I know Jesus has died for people in that people group, and so I'm going to go. The gospel is going to compel me to go because Jesus died for me when I was an enemy rebelling against him, so it just makes sense for me to give my life doing the same for... Uh, People in Al Shabaab over here, like it just makes sense. The gospel compels that. It, that'll only happen when they're seen in the Word week after week after week. And I, I, I pray that'll be the fruit of our teaching of the Word. One more objection or thought bubble yeah. someone has. Yeah. All right, they think, um, you know what? There's lots of need right around me, and our church is more oriented toward the city. We want to reach our city and meet the needs around us. What do you say? I would say, okay, so where in Scripture is it like just focus on your city and don't think about the nations? Like I, I would just, so biblically, even, even from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth, and we have been given, so just, just think about Jesus' command to us in the Great Commission, make disciples of all the nations, of all the people groups. That's a, that's a clear, it's not just a general command to make disciples among as many people as possible. That is a specific command to make disciples of every people group in the world, every ethne. However we define those, we have done our best to try to define them, but so how are we getting the gospel to all of them? We have a clear command. Like it is incumbent upon us in this room to work together to get the gospel to those who have never heard. And, uh, and so, yes, make disciples right where we live. No question. Um, and our, our church is in Washington, D.C., your church is wherever it is for the spread of the gospel in that city, without question. Mm -hmm. But there are, there, are, there are more believers at this conference than there are in Turkey. Like, we've been given a command to take the gospel to all the peoples. Like, somebody's got to go to Turkey for the spread of the gospel there. More people, many, many, many more laborers got to go there and all kinds of other places. And uh, the Great Commission won't be accomplished if we just make disciples where we are right now. Yes, there's always need around us. The other thing I would say there is oftentimes that's a spiritual smoke screen. Like, we're not really doing that much for needs around us. But even if we were, uh, even if we were, then we've been given a clear command, not just, the, the Great Commission won't be accomplished, that's what I'm saying if we're just making disciples right where we live. That's where I'm actually, I want to be careful even in language, uh, talking about missionary, uh, not just to say everybody's a missionary, uh, which means we're on mission right where we live. Like, yes, that's absolutely true. At the same time, if we just go on mission right where we live, two plus billion people will continue to be born and live and die without ever even hearing the gospel. At some point, somebody's got to leave where they are, they live, to go where the gospel's not yet gone. And... Uh, 
the Bible compels us to do that. David Platt, thank you for your passion for the world that ignites a passion in us. Will you thank David Platt? Yeah. Yeah.